Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks for the, for the introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm excited to share the results of my research, which, as, as was mentioned, was partially funded by GSOC. And for that, I'm really appreciative. Um, this is the title of my master's thesis work, um, Spatial Variations in Ancient Meteoric Water, an Investigation of the Rattlesnake Tuff. Um, before I start, I just want to say that this was a really interesting project to work on um, for a master's thesis. I think because as soon as I got started on it, I realized um, just how much I could do with it. And so it was an interesting exercise um, to make it all fit into one master's size project. Um, but I kind of want to start in maybe a, a slightly non-traditional way, just by sharing with everybody the questions that motivated my research at the very beginning, because um, I think they're helpful to keep in mind as I sort of go through all the rest of this work here. Um, so first, how do stable isotope values from the 7 million year old rattlesnake tuff compare to stable isotope values derived from modern water? Second, how and why do isotopes in the rattlesnake tuff ash deposit very spatially across central Oregon? How can differences between modern and 7 million year old isotope records be explained by changes in climate and topography? And finally, are any of the observed variations in stable isotopes or water content related to variations in glass composition? Um, so right there, perhaps I may have introduced some terms that some people are a little bit confused by. So I wanna go ahead and define a few of these terms for the audience just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So, so we're gonna start by just defining a few important terms which are sort of critical to understanding the rest of, of this talk. So first, when I sit, talk about meteoric water, meteoric water is really just water that exists because it fell from the atmosphere, okay? It was at one point in the atmosphere, it experienced lots of different processes up there and then eventually fell to the earth, okay? Also a stable isotope, in case we're not clear on what that is, um, is an atom containing a different number of electrons, or sorry, well, not electrons, neutrons, that's a typo, um, which means that it has a larger nucleus. Um, and because of that, uh, but also does not decay radioactively, meaning over time it retains those neutrons in its nucleus. Um, and finally, delta D is, a, is a, a way of comparing the amount of deuterium, which is a stable isotope of hydrogen, um, to standard mean ocean water, or essentially the stable isotopic composition of the ocean. Great, so starting off right away, what we see here on this slide are three isotopes of hydrogen, okay? And these are the three isotopes of hydrogen that occur naturally on Earth. Um, and on the right, we see um, tritium, which is a, an isotope of hydrogen that is not stable. It is radioactive. It has two extra neutrons in its nucleus. And because of that, um, it decays over time. Okay. So for the purposes of this talk, we are not interested in tritium. Okay. We are more interested in protium and deuterium, which have zero and one neutron or extra neutron in their nucleus, respectively. Um, and so the reason that we care about these is because protium and deuterium are stable isotopes of hydrogen that exist naturally in all water. And um, their relative abundances are really a function of lots of different um, processes that occur in the atmosphere. So what we see here is a very simplified cross section of Western Oregon, which I think is a really good way to describe sort of some of the processes that influence um, the relative abundances of protium and deuterium in meteoric water. So what we see here, if we start all the way on the west in the Pacific Ocean is that our water in the ocean has a delta D value of zero, okay? And so that means, first of all, that it is our standard. It is the composition that we compare all other waters to. Um, and so then as we begin to evaporate our water out of the ocean, we start to see some of these atmospheric processes take place and start to affect our delta D values. And so as we move over the coast range and the Cascades, we see our delta D values start to decrease, okay? And so this is in the modern system, what we see is that by the time we reach the Eastern side of the Cascades, we have depleted deuterium, which is our heavy hydrogen isotope um, from meteoric water by about 100 per mil or more. 
Um, this is a, a figure from John Bershaw, who's my advisor, gave a talk here a couple of months ago, um, which is sort of illustrating the same process that I just described, but this time doing so with um, actual data that was collected from modern water in Oregon. And so what we can see here is that as we start on the western side of the state, all of these dots and their shapes are basically just reflective of the environment that the water was collected from. Um, so there's a yeah, there's a, there's a legend up there for lakes and rivers. And so what we see as we move eastward across the mountain ranges of, of Western Oregon, we get a pretty steep decline in deuterium. Um, but as we reach the Eastern side of the Cascade Range and continue to move across the high desert of Eastern Oregon, the slope of that decline gets a lot less steep, right? Um, and so that's important because we can really sort of start to characterize the different types of, of conditions that influence this, this decrease in deuterium, right? And so um, typically when we, when we do this in the field, we sort of break it down into three main effects, which I've outlined here. First being the altitude effect, which describes the tendency for areas of higher elevation to produce precipitation with lower delta D values, more negative delta D values. The second is the amount effect, which describes the tendency for areas with higher amounts of precipitation to have lower delta D values. And this is especially true um, at lower latitudes, so maybe not quite as strong of an effect here in Oregon. And then third, we have the continental effect, which describes the um, progressive isotope fractionation or, or depletion of deuterium in the atmosphere um, as a result of being further away from the moisture source or the ocean, right? So in this case, we're sourcing the water in the atmosphere from the Pacific. Okay, so that's how our stable isotopes beha <clears throat> behave in the atmosphere, right? But once the water gets on the ground, that those, those changes to our stable isotope ratios don't just stop, okay? And so we also can characterize sort of how um, our stable isotopes behave in surface waters as well. So um, it's really important to keep in mind that evaporation plays a really significant role in adjusting or changing our delta D values of surface waters. Um, essentially, evaporation enriches surface waters with heavier isotopes or deuterium in this case. Um, also, surface waters at higher altitudes tend to receive precipitation that is depleted and has dear isotopes. And finally, it's important also to recognize that when you take a water sample from some surface reservoir, you are more, more likely than not sort of receiving or sampling water that has um, been influenced by lots and lots of inputs, right? And so if you're sampling from a large lake, for example, you may be sampling water that fell in a stream at a high altitude and, and came down to that stream, but all, or to that lake, but also from precipitation that fell directly on that lake. Um, and so it's really important to keep all this in mind when we use stable isotopes to try to reconstruct paleo environments. Um, and so what this slide is, there's a lot going on here, I recognize, but really what's going on here is um, I'm trying to, I, I, I sought a way to express the um, influences of the three main effects that I just outlined as they currently exist in modern Eastern Oregon. Um, so the map on the left is a map that I produced um, using a, a tool in ArcGIS that essentially does sort of a statistical um, interpolation between data points and produces a three-dimensional surface. And um, we call this an isoscape, which is really just a way of showing how stable isotope values vary across space, okay? Um, and then this red line is kind of arbitrary, but really it's just to show that the, the three graphs here on, on the side are, are representative of that entire distance across the eastern part of the state. Um, and really what, what I want you to focus on here are the R squared values that are displayed on the right sides of these graphs. Um, which are more or less reflective of how strong each of these effects is on the delta D values in modern Oregon. And so what we see, for example, is that the amount effect plays pretty much no role on determining the delta D value of some meteoric water sample in modern Oregon, whereas the continental effect, right, which really just describes how far away we are from the Pacific, 
is the dominant control on our delta D values, okay? And that's reflected in this map because what we see is essentially the bars of color moving across the map are more or less parallel to lines of longitude, right? And so as we move further away from the ocean, we're getting lower delta D values. So now that we understand some more about how uh, stable isotopes behave in the atmosphere and on, in surface waters, I wanna move into um, where volcanic glass comes into this picture, okay? So what we see here is a, a pretty simplified cartoon of sort of the life cycle of volcanic glass as it relates to um, hydration with water. And so if we start in the magma chamber, right, which is this big red circle here, um, we typically see magmas are hydrated with water to somewhere between two and six weight percent, okay? Uh, but following eruption processes, we see nearly all of that water um, degas, right, the escape to the atmosphere such that um, newly erupted volcanic glass typically contains somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5% water by weight. Um, but then the process that is critical to my research is the last one, right? Which is that um, after deposition, volcanic glass can be rehydrated by meteoric water um, back up to about greater than 2% water by weight. Um, and we also have an understanding of what controls um, this rehydration process. So um, before I get into that, I wanna just reference this, this figure here on the right, which is sort of showing a, a really zoomed in cross section of what the hydrated volcanic glass looks like um, and also its composition. So what we see here <clears throat> is that all the way to the left of this figure, we have pristine glass, which is essentially volcanic glass that has not been hydrated by meteoric water. And then um, somewhere from like two to, to five microns or so of the outermost part of the glass shard is rehydrated by this meteoric water from the environment after eruption. And that's the water that we are interested in measuring for this research. Um, and this process is sort of controlled by essentially um, hydrogen ions from water replacing metal ions in the glass. And so what you see in the lower part of this figure is essentially that all those metal ions, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, drop off, pretty much go to zero in the hydrated part of the glass. And that's because they're being replaced by hydrogen. So that's the process that we call rehydration. Um, and what controls this? Well, first, we think that seasonality plays a really important role in this. So essentially, um, if a, a region receives, receives most of its rain um, during one particular particular season over another, um, we might expect um, certain, certain clay minerals like smectites in volcanic soils to swell up during those heavy rainfall periods and actually block a lot of the water from reaching further down into the, into the deposit and hydrating that glass. Um, also, it's been determined experimentally that rhyolitic glass, which is sort of what we're talking about in this presentation, hydrates more slowly than basaltic glass. Um, another important factor is the degree of welding, which really just means how well are all these individual glass shards cemented together? How well compressed are they? How much space is there in that rock? If there's not a lot of space, the water has a hard time getting in. And finally, um, this is a really critical process, this last one here, the formation of the passivating or gel layer, which is shown on the right side of this figure, um, is basically a, a layer that forms, um, which, is, which as you can see is really, really high in silica, forms over about 10,000 years after deposition, at which point, um, because it's so dense and composed of silica, it's resistant to weathering and it stops further hydration from occurring. And so, what we assume from this process is that the water in our glass that we are analyzing is representative of the paleo environment from between zero and 10,000 years after the eruption occurred, okay? So let's just recap everything that I've said so far because it's a lot of background, but it's important to understand. So first, Delta D in meteoric water is controlled by various factors which are listed up here. Um, and in modern central Oregon, we see that the continental effect is dominant, but that um, the altitude, altitude also plays a small role in, in certain parts of Eastern Oregon. 
Um, and finally, volcanic glass has been shown to incorporate and preserve stable isotopes from meteoric water over geologic time scales. So what did I do? We're there now. Um, so I sampled volcanic glass from the rattlesnake tuff, which is a high silica um, rhyolitic ash flow tuff that erupted um, from around the Harney Basin, which is sort of, sort of here about 7 million years ago. Um, and it erupted as a single unit and cooled as a single unit, which means it forms these really spectacular, huge blocky outcrops often at the tops of ridges. And it was a very large eruption somewhere between 280 to maybe even 300 cubic kilometers of material were erupted very quickly. Um, and as I sort of mentioned before, you know, welding is, is a one feature of an ash flow tuff, and it has a, ver a varied um, levels of welding as you move through the outcrop, which result in varied samples and varied outcrops. Um, these are some images that I took of, of outcrops of the rattlesnake tuff. Um, what you may notice, especially in this one, is there's lots of different layers as you move up this hill slope, um, which is kind of a challenge because um, for someone like me who is who is not a volcanologist, when I walk up this hill slope and find tough on upon tough upon tough, it can get sort of confusing as to which one I'm actually looking at. And it did. Um, but the good thing about the rattlesnake tough is that very often it crops out at the top of the hill. So even though it's a long climb, you can find it if you get up there. And these are photos of some of the samples that I collected. Um, and I chose these images because they do a really good job of uh, representing differences in welding. So if we move sort of clockwise, starting in the top left, this is an example of a, of a tuff that was pretty highly welded. And the reason that we can tell that is because all of those sort of lenticular features, the, the gray and the black and the white are pumice shards that have been flattened and compressed by that welding process. Um, and as we move around, we see in the bottom right, for example, this is actually um, a sample from the, the elusive ash fall portion of the rattlesnake tuff, um, which was essentially deposited by a different process. Instead of a flow, we had some, some, some ash falling from the sky. Um, and then finally in the bottom left here, this sample was actually so poorly welded that as soon as I removed it from the outcrop, I had to keep it in a plastic bag because it's just a bag of sand really. Um, so I think next it, it could be useful to sort of understand how the rattlesnake tuff fits into the picture, the big picture of, of Central and Eastern Oregon during the Miocene, okay? So the Miocene is the period of time spanning from 23 to about 5 million years ago. And during that time, uh, Eastern Oregon was a wild place. There were many different volcanic provinces that were active all at the same time. Um, perhaps most notably, at least in my view, would be um, the uplift of the Cascades, right? Which as we know them today are spectacular stratovolcanoes um, that form as a result of the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate under North America. Um, there's some debate about when this started. Some people, including John, my advisor, perhaps would say that these have been a significant topographic barrier since before the Miocene even started. And others say that um, they sort of became tall sort of in the mid to late Miocene. Um, also going on during this time was the emplacement of the Columbia River basalts, which is I'm sure something we're all familiar with, right? Um, and then finally, and importantly for me, we have the, the volcanism of the high lava plains, which were um, a really compositionally diverse set of eruptions that sort of trended um, moving towards the Northwest between about 17 and 5 million years ago, uh, which is interesting because it's sort of opposite to the progression of the Yellowstone hotspot. Um, and then this is not related to volcanism, but at the bottom here I have just sort of for, for reference, the presence of the blue mountains, which have been a significant topographic feature since um, before the Cenozoic. Um, so this is a similar map to what we saw before, right? This is the rattlesnake tuff. The blue shapes are just that, the extent of the outcrops as they exist today, but this time I've added the locations of my samples, okay? Um, excuse me. Um, so what we see here is that I had to travel pretty far into a lot of places that were very hard to get to, to get enough samples to create a, a good enough picture to um, convince you of what I'm gonna tell you. Um, 
And uh, so, so a lot of samples that are already been taken sort of like at the, at the top end of this, um, you can see that, that long east-west feature is very close to John Day, so it's rel relatively accessible. Um, but some of the samples down in, in the south here were really hard to get to. Um, and overall, I, can't, I collected about 40 samples and selected uh, 16 of them for isotopic analysis. Um, the process for preparing volcanic glass for mass spectrometer isotopic analysis is really in-depth. It's, it's, it's a real bear of the process, which is maybe something I would have liked to know a little bit more about before I agreed to do this project. Um, that's okay, it all worked out. So we start by collecting our samples. That is a picture of John, my advisor, appreciating um, Paleosol, actually, this isn't, this isn't a tough, but I like the picture, so I stuck with it. Um, and then we, we move on to crushing every single sample by hand with a ceramic mortar and pestle, which takes a really long time. And I did it, I had to do it at weird hours because I couldn't do it while classes were going on because it was very loud. Um, and once I had that dust, essentially what I did is I, I sieved it down to a specific size fraction between 70 and 150 microns, which is understood to be optimal for isotopic analysis. Following that, there are sort of two stages of acid abrasion, which you do to essentially remove everything from the surface of the glass shards um, so that you don't have any contamination by any other sorts of substances that may contain water. Um, the second of those, the hydrofluoric acid wash, is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I never want to do it again, just because hydrofluoric acid is just about the nastiest chemical that exists. Um, but it's necessary for removing certain precipitates from the surfaces of glass shards. Um, once that's done, this is an image of a, of a separatory funnel with a heavy liquid in it, which is essentially denser than the glass shards that I'm interested in. And so you dilute it with water until just the glass, which is sort of this cloudy stuff at the top, floats. And then you can essentially remove all the contaminants there, that brown stuff at the bottom and you're left with just the glass floating at the top of the funnel. And after you do that, you're ready for um, isotopic analysis. This is a picture of the lab that I went to at the University of Texas um, to do my isotope analyses. Um, and these are pictures of the glass shards that I separated. And um, at first glance, what you may be thinking and what I thought was, these don't look clean. This is bad, and I was pretty stressed out. Um, but I was reminded um, by Martin Streck, who is an expert on the rattlesnake tuff, that it is a very compositionally diverse tuff. And while we usually think of it as very high silica, there are certainly parts of it that contain lots and lots of iron and are, and are um, more, more primitive in composition. And so all of these shards that look- How really does the appearance of the volcanic glass change when it's dehydrated? And then my last question is, what's the tuff? Okay, great. Um, you don't quite know how the appearance changes. We, we think maybe it doesn't really. Um, this is oftentimes a process that occurs um, very slowly and there haven't actually been that many um, um, rhyolitic eruptions in human history. Um, there are two actually that I'll talk about sort of at the end of this. Um, so we haven't really observed it well. So I don't, but to my knowledge, it, it really doesn't change too much. Um, and then a tuff is just a, a rock that forms from the, the compression of, of volcanic ash, basically. Um, and in this case, the, the ash flowed from, from the eruptive center over, over the ground like, like a lahar might, um, but it can also fall from the sky. And so you can sort of, a lahar is a, a volcanic mud flow, right? It's kind of just like, you could imagine it like water, right? Um, versus, so that's how this was deposited, but you can also get ash erupted up into the atmosphere and then it falls down like, like rain, right? And so you can kind of tell the differences um, in the textures of the rocks. So that's how we know how it was deposited. I think I've said everything I wanna say about this. We'll move on. I wanna just really quickly talk about how a mass spectrometer works because maybe that's an instrument people haven't heard of or aren't familiar with and that's okay. It's a way of measuring the mass of like individual like atoms, right? Or particles that yeah, make up material. And so essentially what you do is you take, like in my case, I took my glass and I put it up there in the source, right? Which is kind of like a furnace, like a really hot um, um, chamber that essentially vaporizes the material. And then it's launched 
around this curve here, okay, by this magnet. And the amount that the that the that the particle deflects is in, is sort of reflective of its mass, right? And so you can get a bunch of different detectors. There are three down here in this image, but um, you can have more than that if you want to. And each detector is positioned such that it will receive um, particles of different masses. And so you can really just figure out how much of each particle there is in your, uh, in your sample. Okay, so we did the mass spectrometer analysis and boom, we have another isoscape. This is just like the one that I showed you before in terms of how it was developed. But this time, instead of showing modern water, I'm showing you water that was that rehydrated the rattlesnake tuff about um, seven million years ago. And what jumped out to me right away from this image is that if we if we notice that this black hexagon represents the inferred eruptive center of the rattlesnake tuff, where we think all the material was vented from. If you squint, not too hard, you can see that what we have here is our lowest delta D values sort of clustered around this eruptive center. And that's super interesting and super exciting. But the first thing that I thought to myself was that I was concerned that maybe we had some influences on delta D by primary magnetic processes. And so I wanted to make sure that that was not the case. Um, so that people would believe my paleo environmental interpretations more. Um, and so I kind of went about doing this in a couple of different ways, both using the SEM. So this is an image of a block of one of my samples. And what's notable about it is that at the top, we have um, sort of a, a weathering rind, as you might call it. Um, but I've been told that it is not weathering um, and that instead we should just refer to it as an oxidation rind. Okay, so what, what's basically going on here, and, and we don't have that in the bottom part of this block, right? Um, and so basically what's going on here, if I zoom in with the scanning electron microscope to see these really cool images, is that in the oxidized part of our sample, um, all of the pore spaces and even some of the rims of the shards are being filled up by um, products of oxidation, right? Probably clay minerals forming in these spaces, we can even see some tiny blood cracks forming in some of those, some of those um, precipitates there in the middle. Um, and we see a whole lot less of them in the oxidized part and, and in the unoxidized part. And what I'm really interested in is sort of this texture here along the edge of the, of the glass shard, which I was concerned might be indicative of um, some influence by these secondary processes on the outermost part of the shard. Um, so I answered that by basically compiling some data from the SEM. Um, when you look at these, excess oxygen is really just a proxy for water content, okay? And the reason that we have to do it that way is because you can't measure hydrogen with the scanning electron microscope. Um, and following some statistical analyses, even though these maybe look a little bit different, what we found is that they're not statistically different. So what we can say is that between the, the weathered and unweathered or the oxidized and unoxidized populations, the water content is the same, so great. Our oxidation is not affecting how much water is in the sample. But what we do see is that, uh, and BSD grayscale is really just what you can consider to be a qualitative um, proxy for composition. What we see is that those populations are statistically different from each other, which makes sense, right? We're forming lots of, of minerals in those pore spaces between the glass shards, which are going to alter the composition of our tuff. Um, which supports the whole process that I went through to remove those um, precipitates. Um, the second question that I tried to answer was, was whether or not primary compositional differences in our glass shards, right? So after I removed all of the contaminants in the surfaces of the shard and we were left with just the pristine glass, um, whether the differences between those in terms of their composition we're affecting our stable isotopes or water content. So this is an image of uh, basically glass shards mounted in epoxy, which is also what that image was of on the, the last slide. If you can see there's just tiny little bits of glass in a block of epoxy that I analyze in the SEM. Um, so this is an image of, of those shards of glass. Um, something that's important to point out in this image is that the surfaces of these glass shards are incredibly rough, right? And that's a problem. 
Um, when you do analyses in the SEM, you need your surface of whatever you're analyzing to be very smooth because otherwise you lose a lot of your signal from the electron beam to just sort of being scattered all over the place. And so I tried to polish these um, using the method that you would to polish any rock. And I found that it was not sufficient because these are pretty much destroyed, um, but we went for it anyway. Um, and so these are sort of some, some box and whisker plots that are just displaying um, essentially differences in the abundances of various elements by weight percent. Um, and the only thing that I really want to point out here is that sample 13C, which is on the left side of each of these plots is an outlier almost every time. Um, and that's important um, for understanding something in a couple of slides here. Um, what we see here is uh, the distribution of unnormalized weight percent totals. So what does that mean? Okay, what that means is essentially that um, when you measure any compositional feature in the SEM, you want your weight percent to be 100 or as close to it as it can be. And that's really just a way to, to tell how good of an analysis you just did. What we can see here is that my weight percent totals were clustered at like 50 or less. Okay, so that's bad. And that's a result of those really rough surfaces that I showed you a couple of slides ago. So we sort of have to go through the rest of this analysis, understanding that the quality of the data was very low, but still an interesting exercise. Um, there's a lot to digest here on this screen again, um, but really what, what these are showing uh, is whether or not there's an any sort of significant relationship between the amount of water in a sample and the abundance of some element in that sample. Um, and so at first glance, what we might see is that um, we have really high R squared values in some cases, but um, in each of those cases, those R squared values are controlled by an outlier. And the outlier is sample MT13C, which is the one that was compositionally unique. Um, and so I, what, what we sort of decided is that perhaps sample MT13C had something else going on. Um, and so because of that, it, in both the case of, of these graphs and also this, this other relationship that we investigated, which was delta D versus the abundance of some element that we didn't see significant enough um, evidence to suggest that primary compositional differences in glass were affecting the water. Um, and that's really good. That means that essentially we know that the water in our glass is reflective of the environment immediately after deposition. Um, and then finally, this is just another way to ensure that we don't have a lot of influence of water from the magma chamber in our glass, right? We have to do a lot of checks to make sure that the water we are, we are analyzing is actually environmental meteoric water. Um, and so the lack of a relationship here supports that. Great. So from all of that, what do we know? We know that the alteration of untreated tuff does not affect water content, but does affect glass composition. Um, we also know that treated glass shards have significantly different compositions, but that those composition differences do not influence the water or the stable isotopes in our glass. And finally, the lack of a relationship between delta D and weight percent water suggests no magmatic influence. So with all of that, we can make comparisons between the modern isoscape and the ancient one. And we're still left with this really interesting difference in the, the distribution of our isotopes, right? Why don't we see the same level of, of, of um, depletion of delta D as we move towards the eruptive center that we do in the past? Well, I employed the same framework that I did um, the first time to sort of answer this question, right, which is by sort of considering those three main effects, the altitude amount and continental effects, and trying to explain this shape that I see in my isoscape. Um, so what we see here is three transects, which are sort of highlighted by these three colored lines, and the colors of those lines correspond to the colors of the, the lines on this graph, okay? Um, and then the fourth red line over there is the modern water line, okay? And so what I'm looking at here is how do um, isotopes behave as we move across these transects, okay? And so what we see in, in the modern system is that um, as we would expect in an area sort of dominated by the continental effect, 
Moving eastward in that red line, we see just a gradual decrease in delta D values, right? And in both the red and green or northern and southern transects, we see more or less the same trend. It's a little bit steeper, um, but overall it's, it's quite similar. Um, but then this blue trend, right, which is the one in the middle of the graph and sort of, or of the map and sort of runs directly across sort of that central area where we think the eruptive center of the rattlesnake tuff was, we see significantly more negative delta D values. And we also see a significantly steeper decline in delta D values. Um, and so as I sort of um, suggest here on this graph, I attribute that difference to the altitude effect, right? So what does that mean exactly? It means that I think there was some significant amount of altitude or elevation, sorry, in this region 7 million years ago that we no longer see today. So that's a pretty interesting thing to conclude. Um, and now I have to explain how I think it got there and where it went. Um, so first, let's just dis discuss how we sort of estimate a paleo elevations from this information. Um, essentially, we use what's called a lapse rate, which is basically just a, a rate of change in, in stable isotopic values relative to elevation. And we, we calculated these using modern data. So we know how tall, for example, um, a Newberry volcano is, so we can measure um, you know, stable isotope values on the ground, like down low and bend, and then up on top of the volcano and see how different they are and attribute that difference to elevation. So I used three different lapse rates, which were sort of developed by three different people to estimate that the paleo elevation 7 million years ago that would have been needed to produce this anomaly in our isotopes was between 1.3 and 2.8 kilometers in relief, which is pretty significant. Um, this is a really simplified figure because I honestly don't know the best way to describe this, but um, I'll go ahead and give you um, a little bit of, of what I'm talking about here. So essentially what we see is in gray, the gray shapes in this figure are um, basically tough, right? Rhyolitic, I should say, rhyolitic material that was a result of the rattlesnake tough eruption, okay? And um, so in this image, what I'm showing is basically we've got our, our rattlesnake ash flow tuff on the flanks of this large geologic topographic feature, and then maybe even some sort of like rhyolitic dome feature at the center of that where the eruption occurred. Um, and that's what would have existed maybe 10,000 years or so after the eruption. But today, we don't see any of that. It's actually a basin, right? It's sort of a, a topographic low. Um, and the only, the only elevation that we see in, in the rattlesnake tuff is sort of um, basically deposits of the rattlesnake tough on either side of the region where the eruption occurred, which is maybe better described by this map. So this is a, a map showing the thickness of the rattlesnake tough. This is from Martin Streck. Um, the erupted center in this map is represented by this dot right here. And so what we see in the modern system is that there are no outcrops of the rattlesnake tough in the general vicinity of the area that it erupted from, right? But instead what we do see is that the rattlesnake tough is sort of thickest um, at the centers of its deposits and it thins um, away from those thickest areas. Um, so I wanna sort of give my conclusions here some context, right? Because what I've done is basically just told you that there was a mountain, oh, was it doing this? No, it didn't, okay. What I basically just told you is that there was a mountain. Great, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I want to sort of give this some context and talk about a different study that sort of aimed to accomplish the same thing as me because what I've just done is told you that there was a mountain in the Harney Basin that existed 7 million years ago and was 2000 meters tall and now it's gone, right? Which is kind of bold. Um, but it turns out that there is some, some, some other work that's been done in a similar space that sort of has found uh, similar features or similar patterns for features that still exist. So what we see here um, is a, a study done by Tyler Kukla in 2021. Um, and he is using stable isotopes from, from oxygen, um, which work exactly the same way as the ones that I'm talking about from hydrogen. Um, and basically he tried to see if, if he could find evidence for topography in the blue mountains in these isotopes. And what we see here is essentially um, this is uh, a box showing this, this study area within Oregon here. 
is that as we move eastward across the Blue Mountains, um, we see significant decreases in, in isotope values moving towards negative values as we move across the mountains. And this record exists in, in soils up to 50 million years ago, right? So what we see essentially is that um, these stable isotopes respond to altitude in this way in the Blue Mountains. And so I suggest that they can do the same um, in the Harney Basin or on top of some uh, volcanic edifice that used to exist there. So at the end here, I just kind of want to talk about how we can build topography from some sort of feature like the rattlesnake tuff eruption. So what we see here are, are two um, rhyolitic domes that have formed or at least partially formed during with, within the last 100 years or so. I um, mean, these are actually the only two rhyolitic eruptions that have occurred um, in human history, right? So these are sort of the only two things we have to base our, our uh, conclusions on. But um, there on the top, we have the Nova Rupta eruption, which occurred in Alaska in 1912. And um, it was a pretty voluminous eruption, but not nearly on the scale of the rattlesnake tuff. And, and after it erupted, what we saw was the, the building of sort of a, a rhyolitic dome, which is this feature here, which built up to about 100 meters high in about 20 years or so after the eruption, right? So that's not the topography on the scale that we're looking for, but it is proof that rhyolitic eruptions can potentially build topography. In the bottom here, we have the Chaiten rhyolitic dome, which exists in uh, Chile and most recently erupted in 2008, but we know it's been active for maybe 10,000 years or so. Um, and this built a dome, which was about 1,100 meters high, which is more on the scale in terms of altitude of what we're looking at, right? And so this is one way that you can build topography um, from a rhyolitic eruption is through essentially like after the explosive eruption occurs, you get slow effusion of lava out of the ground that builds this dome, right? Another way that you can build topography um, is through resurgent doming, which is an interesting uh, concept to me, something I wasn't super familiar with until about a week before I defended my thesis, which is kind of a, an interesting exercise. Um, but what we see here is essentially a magma chamber full of lava or magma, right, that erupts. And as that happens and the, the space where the lava once existed is evacuated, we start to see subsidence filling in that that void, right? But if you're in a volcanically active region, you can see magma start to refill that chamber and actually sort of form like a structural um, inversion, right? That causes uplift of this, this caldera to form some sort of topographic feature um, and, and eventually can produce some significant topography. This is the Valles caldera in New Mexico. Um, which has a relief of about 3,000 feet. And this is an example of a resurgent dome. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head when this erupted, but what we do know is that this topography was built solely by essentially resurgent doming of this rhyolitic eruptive center after it erupted. And this is again on the scale of um, sort of the, the scale that we're talking about. So um, wrapping up here, because I think I'm, just about out of time or maybe even a little bit over, um, I wanted to sort of answer my questions now in a, in a very straightforward way. So if we start with our first question here, how do stable isotope values from the seven million year old rattlesnake tuff compare to stable isotopes derived from, media, from modern water? We see that seven million year old Delta D values feature lower values centered around the rattlesnake tuff eruptive center. Um, and that ancient values are much lower than modern at the western edge of the stu study area and become progressively lower moving east. Second, how and why do isotopes in the widespread rattlesnake tough ash deposit vary spatially across central Oregon? We see delta D values from the rattlesnake tough show gradual depletion moving eastward with an area of very low delta D centered around the rattlesnake tough eruptive center. Um, and we, or I, I should say, describe um, these variations using the continental, but mostly the elevation effect. Third, how can uh, differences between modern and seven million year old isotope records be explained through changes in climate and topography? Well, I infer or suggest that perhaps there was some significant topographic feature um, whose origin is to be determined. 
um, that was between 1.3 and 2.8 kilometers high in the immediate vicinity of the rattlesnake tuft eruptive center. Um, and finally, are any of the observed variations in staple isotopes or water content related to variations in glass composition? Um, we see evidence that suggests that secondary mineralization and oxidation does not significantly affect uh, water in untreated tuff. And we also conclude that glass shard composition does not obviously affect water content or stable isotopes. Um, so I would really love for somebody to try to figure out a way to, to answer um, the question that I have sort of created in suggesting that there was a giant mountain that's gone. I think that there could be a lot sort of hidden in the sediments of the Harney Basin, which is a project that John, my advisor, is trying to get grad students to work on. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And that's kind of where I would hope people would go in the future with this work. Um, I think also you could do similar work with a different widespread ash flow tuff, like the Divine Canyon or the Dinner Creek tuff. Um, and yeah. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you to the funders of this work and to everyone who helped me. Take some questions. Um, we'll take some questions from both our Zoom audience and folks in the room. Let's start with someone in the room. You wanna? Question, uh, what does the effect of temperature have on the Delta D valve? Obviously the, the, uh, the eruption is a very hot event, but does that affect it? Mm, yeah, so- repeat the question. Yes. The question was, what effect does temperature have on Delta D? Um, so in terms of the eruption, right, what we're assuming is that the water in our glass is not affected by eruptive processes, right? Following the, the eruption, degassing occurs. And so nearly all of that primary water that was in the glass is gone, right? And so, um, and then the cooling should occur on the time scale slightly slower than the overall time that it takes to hydrate the glass. Um, so in that case, I would say the, the temperature of the rock probably doesn't significantly affect the, the rehydration, but the temperature of the environment that the meteoric water exists in does matter, right? And so this is especially true when it comes to, for example, like precipitation falling um, in, in areas that are really hot or evaporation occurring. Um, and in that case, we actually find that areas that are really hot um, have less negative delta D values. So basically the extra energy that it takes to keep heavy isotopes as a gas um, um, means that uh, basically hot areas have more heavy isotopes as water vapor in the atmosphere. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Carol, do we have any questions from Zoom? Uh, Gary, uh, I think so might have some questions. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, mine was just so, so simplistic. Um, I was curious as to why uh, atmospheric water or meteoric, uh, meteoric water uh, was referred as such instead of simply being rain. Uh, are you trying to distinguish uh, rainfall from other sources uh, that might be uh, 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 some type of magma displacement or uh, volcanic in origin. What's the framework for uh, in which meteoric water fits? Yeah, so I guess you could call it rain, but then you would be omitting things like snow. First, you know, just sort of basically, but but it is a good question because um, you know it really is important to remember that meteoric water is any water that has existed in the atmosphere, which is where all of these important processes that alter the, the, the isotopic composition occur, right? Versus like water from magma, which we call magmatic water, um, has not experienced um, those same processes. So it's really important to, to um, clarify that we are interested in the meteoric water that hydrates this glass and not the magmatic water that potentially had hydrated it in the past. Let's have a question from the room. That kind of answered my question. I just, when I read the name of the talk, I thought we were going to see some meteorites. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person in the front row here. I have two questions. Well, one is, uh, I know the Newbury Monument is in that area. 
mentioned in Spanish for its obsidian is it's obsidian volcanic glass. Yes. And is Question. that the kind of glass you were uh, you were um, analyzing or did you analyze other kinds of glass as well? Okay, so um, the question was, is obsidian volcanic glass and was I analyzing it? Um, yes, obsidian is volcanic glass. No, I was not analyzing it. Um, the, the glass that I was analyzing is really like super, super tiny shards of glass um, that, that were cemented together um, after eruption, right? They didn't cool as a singular big block of glass like you might visualize obsidian being, but rather, um, were lots and lots of tiny shards that only sort of stuck together um, once they had already flowed away from the volcano. And so um, typically the glass shards that I was studying were between like 70 and 150 microns across. So like really almost too small to see with your eye. And when twin mics and collide are like are in that area, how are they? I do not know. That's a question. <laughs> oh yeah, the question was how were the twin lakes and what's the other one? The uh, other lake, Polano Lake. lake. You mentioned the Polano Basin. Yeah, uh, the, the, Harney? the Harney Basin. No, I saw Polano on your on map. It may have been on the map. And if it was, then it was, but I'm not familiar <laughs> with it. Yeah. Um, All right. I think, uh, does we, do we have a question? Charlie? Charlie, go uh, ahead. I, I was just wondering, since you're doing isotopic analysis, if you did any isotopic analysis of iron, since that's a major contaminant of the glass, maybe um, as the volcanic rocks come up, may come from different sources underneath the volcano and therefore have different isotope ratios. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I did not do any isotopic analyses of, of iron. The lab that I went to was really set up just to do light stable isotopes. So like hydrogen and oxygen mostly. Um, the, I think again, what's really important to remember is that in the case of, of this project and of, of paleoclimatology in general, when it comes to the isotopes that we're analyzing, we're really operating under the assumption that the isotopes are from secondary hydration, right? And so the assumption is that the composition of the glass, the primary composition of the glass is not important. Um, and I tried to sort of prove that with my SEM work, but I, I, you know, I wish that my data was a little bit better and a little bit more convincing. But um, I think certainly if you were interested in sort of um, more questions related to like petrogenesis, right, then certainly you'd be a, a lot more interested in, in, you know, primary iron isotopes or other types of isotopes. Question from the room, Bonnie. Sure. You, I think you said that the mass spectrometer you were using could not separate out hydrogen isotopes. So you used oxygen isotopes. Okay, yes. So that's the scanning electron microscope. Yes, not the, not the oh, mass spectrometer. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that is an important point. Um, basically, yes, the, the mass or the uh, ma scanning electron microscope cannot directly measure hydrogen. Why? Um, it has to do with basically the scanning electron microscope like works by shooting electrons at other atoms and then exciting electrons off of those atoms. And um, you can't do that with hydrogen, I think because it only has one. And so it, it, you can't get the electron off of it, you know? Um, so it can't detect it. So if you want to detect water, you sort of have to do it by measuring oxygen in two different ways and, and differencing them to sort of, and, and basically making an assumption that the, the excess oxygen that you detected with one method versus another is there because there's water in your sample. We have uh, maybe one more question from the, from uh, the room for- Leslie might still have a question or maybe got an answer. Leslie, do you want to unmute? Yes, surely I could speak. Um, now, I'm not a geologist, and so my question is naive. Um, I don't, I, I've, I was baby barely able to hang on to following your process, but what I missed was an understanding of how the results of your study can be used in some sort of practical way. I'm sure you may have alluded to it and others understood what you were saying, but I, I really did not get that part. Could you help me out with that? Sure. I think um, 
I think that the geologic basins are an incredibly important feature to understand because very often they are um, the, the source of, of very important resources for us like water and fossil fuels are sort of the two that come to mind right away. Um, and so because the, the feature that I am sort of suggesting existed, existed on top of what is now a geologic basin in the Harney Basin, um, which exists in a part of Oregon where certainly certain resources like water can be scarce, right? Understanding the geologic history of that basin, which is something we don't understand super well, um, could be really important in the future as we continue to sort of think about issues related to resource availability and things like that. Thank you. Any further questions? Yep, yep, yep. This is something completely different. Solar eclipse is coming up, so a meteoric water may block our solar eclipse coming. <laughs> meteoric water would block the solar eclipse. Well, if it was from a meteorite, maybe. Well, I, I'm just before the meeting's over. I just wanted to make sure there's a solar eclipse coming sometime in October. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right. I think I, I saw one more question, and then um, I'm hope we'll, we'll, we'll move on to snacks. And uh, I'm hoping that some of you uh, who participated in the assistance today can stay for a quick rebrief. Denny, did you have a question? Yeah, there was one slide that showed the uh, inferred eruptive center down near uh, Burns and uh, some contours there. Hmm. Uh, were the contours and the eruptive center, were they determined by your sampling or did they come from some other? This one? Is this the figure you're talking about? No. Okay. Uh, oh, maybe. Uh, uh, you went that one. No. Oh. No. Okay, then I think maybe you're talking about this one. Yes. No. Oh, that one. Yeah, I'll hold that. Yes. Okay. So this is the inferred eruptive center, right? And then all of the contours that you see are representative of delta D values that I measured. And so basically you can sort of use this key here to see that as we move towards the eruptive center, our delta D values are getting lower. And that's sort of the basis for my um, interpretation that there had to be significant topography in that region. And, and the, uh, the annotation on that diagram is your is your sampling RST 11? Yeah, those are sample names. Yep. All right. I have one last question. One last what question. about number 13? Yeah, what about it? Did you uh, exclude it? No, okay. it's here. And the reason that it's here is because excluding it didn't make a difference. Oh. And so I just left it to show where it was from. Um, yeah, I, there will be more work to do to try to figure out what's going on there. Um, but what's what's interesting is that even though it was a compositional outlier, um, its delta D value still fit within the model. So it, it didn't really make a big difference in that case. Right. Julian, thank you so much. <laughs>